locust swarms in Africa, caterpillars right here in Ontario. And can we please stop talking about murder hornets? It seems bugs of all kinds, unlike us, are having quite a summer. Let's find out more with Rosalind Murray. She's an entomologist and an NSERC. That stands for Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Toronto. And she joins us now from the provincial capital. Rosalind, it's really nice to meet you. Hi, thanks for having me. Well, this year has been a lot with the pandemic, and now there are locust invasions across a number of countries, uh, mur murder hornets and caterpillars eating their way across eastern uh, Ontario. Is this a 2020 thing, or is there a scientific explanation about what all this stuff is happening, why it's happening? Yeah, there's almost always a scientific explanation for why all this stuff is happening. Um, in particular, the murder hornets, uh, well, that's not so sciencey as it is uh, just humans brought them over from Asia, probably accidentally, and they kind of took up residence for a minute, but they don't seem to be a huge problem, certainly not in Ontario. We'll talk more about the murder hornets in a minute, um, but let's start with the headline grabbers. I'm going to read a passage from an editorial from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Uh, Post um, and they write, as COVID-19 rages on, another plague of biblical proportions has been ravaging East Africa, Pakistan and India and parts of South America. Locust swarms. The insects have been appearing in record numbers, stripping fields and destroying crops at a remarkable pace. The swarms have already caused billions of dollars in damage and are threatening the food security of millions. The potential for famine, poverty and death is high. The United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization estimates that the latest swarms threaten the livelihoods of 10% of the world's population. That is dire. Um, why are these regions experiencing these swarms? Yeah, so the locusts uh, are, the, these are called desert locusts, and what they are is basically weird grasshoppers, is what you can kind of think of them as. And most of the time, most years, they spend their lives as solitary animals. You probably wouldn't notice them. There aren't that many of them. They're not making a huge fuss. Nobody's really paying attention. Um, but every once in a while, when the conditions are perfect, like they seem to be this year, we do have this huge boom of the population. So you can have literally billions of insects uh, emerging. And what we think happened this time is that in 2018, there were cyclones that dumped rain and water and um, caused a whole bunch of flooding in these regions. And these locusts like to lay their eggs in damp soil. Obviously, their name implies, uh, their name, which is desert locust, implies that actually there isn't a ton of water most of the time. And we think this boom in population is actually um, the result of being in these uncertain environments. So they're making the best of their environment at this time. How do they spread? Yeah, so you have these huge emergence events. And what's really bizarre uh, about these desert locusts is they completely change their entire physiology. So instead of being these solitary animals that you don't really notice, all of a sudden they become really gregarious. They all form uh, these huge swarms that you saw in those pictures. And they, uh, they fly on the uh, following wind and land, they migrate all over the place, migrating to where they find a good food source. And is that how they go about destroying crops then? Yeah, so they're moving on the wind. So uh, scientists are actually using um, the same technology that they use to track um, wildfires because they spread in the same way on the wind uh, uh, to predict where these animals will end up next. And what they do is they land and they completely decimate an entire field of mm -hmm. crops. I mean, the timing couldn't be worse for this year because I'm assuming that a lot of countries are spending their resources trying to combat uh, COVID-19. Um, what is being done to save crops from these locusts? Yeah, so there's a few things. So this is the worst, um, this is the worst outbreak they've had um, in Kenya in 70 years and in Pakistan and India in about 25 years. So what they're trying to do is spray uh, pesticides to try and uh, get rid of the animals immediately. But that's not ideal because it means you're going to get rid of a lot of other animals as well and, and harm potentially birds, other insects, pollinators, all kinds of stuff that we actually want to be around. Mm -hmm. um, some, some areas are trying to use biopesticides, and by that I mean specific bacteria or um, fungi 
that target the animal in particular, so this desert locust species, and don't harm anything else. The problem with that is that it typically takes a week or two, and within a week or two, when you have a billion animals eating all of your cereal crops, uh, you don't necessarily have that kind of time. We saw the pictures of them flying around uh, people, but did they uh, affect humans in any other way? No, so they're, they're pests in that there are so, so, so many of them and they are destroying crops, but they don't bite people. They're not really interested in people per se. Another one that we're hearing about are cicadas, or some people might say cicadas. <laughs> um, I mean, I like the sound of them and they're also experiencing a population explosion. What's happening with them? Yeah, so this is a group of insects that, similar to the locusts, they don't directly harm humans, so they're not biting humans, they're not doing anything like that, but they do have these boom years. So this is, these are the 13 and 17 year cicadas that we're talking about. And so there are a whole bunch of different broods. Um, and what you hear most of the time in Ontario is cicadas that aren't, um, aren't periodic, so they're not lined up to... Uh, to emerge at the exact same time. So you'll have a few emerging every year, and that's what we generally hear in our gardens um, and in our parks when we're in Southern Ontario in particular. Um, but there is this one species, um, well, there's more than one species. There's a number of periodic lo uh, locusts, I'm still caught up, mm -hmm. uh, cicadas that actually do um, emerge at the exact same time. And what that does is it, it, because it's so rare, either 13 or 17 years, it creates this huge boom of uh, potentially billions of insects emerging for a few weeks in the summer. And their predators can't prepare themselves for such a thing or rely on such an event happening because it happens so infrequently that you have all of these uh, downstream consequences of having this huge bust of cicadas. Um, but like I said, they aren't harmful to humans. Um, and the most annoying thing is that they're extremely, extremely noisy. So they can reach up to 100 decibels if you have enough near you um, chirping. Really? Yes. <laughs> that yeah, they're is inc incredibly noisy. <laughs> that is incredible. Um, you mentioned uh, murder hornets uh, at the beginning. Um, I think for if you're a hip hop fan, you probably heard about the Wu-Tang Clan's killer bees. I think this year, probably a lot of us, it was the first time that we heard about the murder hornets. Are they dangerous? So, I mean, they're as dangerous as any wasp species is. Uh, if you're allergic to uh, the venom that they carry and you're stung, then it can be a huge problem. But for the majority of people, um, they aren't that dangerous, no. You mentioned, uh, there. we have the picture up there. Um, you mentioned that they were coming from Asia. How do they become a problem in North America? So they're not a problem yet. Um, there were a couple of sightings and a nest found in British Columbia and Washington State. Um, they haven't made it to Ontario yet, um, although I should say that the Ontario government has placed them as pests on their um, Bees Act. Uh, so we are prepared for them to be a problem. Uh, we think that they came across probably on a ship. Um, they stowed away in some wood or something else that was being transported. We're not completely sure, but we think that's what's happened. You mentioned um, that it's on the list because of bees. Should Ontario beekeepers be worried about the murder hornets? So not at this point. So what they do, the reason that they're called murder hornets has nothing to do with people per se. It's because they are incredible predators. Um, what they do, because they're so large, they prey on all kinds of um, social hymenoptera. And by that, I mean all kinds of bees and ants that create um, nests. So what they do is they enter in, they call all their buddies by releasing a pheromone and all of their friends from their nest come and they kill all the bees that are in the nest. And so this is particularly um, harmful if you are a beekeeper, right? So they will kill everything. What they're doing is they're trying to feed their families. So they take all of the larvae from the honeybee hive and they take it back to their own nests and they feed their own babies. So because they aren't native here, we, the bees and the ants that are native to Ontario or BC where they've actually been found don't have any defenses against these predators. Is there something that if you do have bees, is there something that you can do right now just to be proactive uh, to prevent anything happening to the bees? 
Yeah, so in Asia, where they do have these giant Asian hornets um, naturally, uh, a lot of beekeepers have put mesh in front of their um, uh, the entrance to the hives, and that's because that works because these uh, these giant Asian hornets, because they're so large, you can actually physically prevent them from entering into the nest. Uh, in the past decade or so, since we're talking about bees, we saw a reduction of bees and they were in trouble. How are they doing now? So they're not great. <laughs> um, in general, insects aren't doing great at this um, period in history. Uh, there, I, when we talk about bees, I just want to differentiate between um, the agricultural bees that we think of, so um, the European honeybee and the wild bees that we have in North America and Ontario. So if we think about the, the boxes or the kept bees, they're more like agricultural animals and they were imported, as the name suggests, from Eurasia. Um, and they are one species of bee. Um, we've done, uh, recent studies have shown that both these imported uh, managed bee populations are really important for pollination, but so are native populations. Um, and that's true for native flowering plants um, and your gardens, as well as crops and agriculture. So both of these managed bees and these natural bees are both really important for pollinating our food. You mentioned that insects aren't doing great right now. Um, is there a reason why? So there's a few reasons. Um, one of the reasons, uh, the main reason, is loss of habitat. So if you think about increasing urbanization, so the sprawl of cities, particularly um, in southern Ontario, that's relevant. Um, agricultural spread as well, where you're getting rid of the um, native plants that would have grown in a meadow, um, as well as pollution from agriculture, from cities. And finally, the one we all know about, climate change, is causing a huge problem where the habitat that these animals are adapted to is completely changing um, from what they're used to. You know, we call this, uh, these few days that we're looking at bugs, um, at bugs, eels, um, and bats, vilified beasts. When we do talk, when we have this conversation where people get kind of squirmy and they're like, oh, me, I get squirmy. <laughs> what do you think is probably the most important thing that we need to keep uh, in mind when we maybe forget the importance of these uh, creatures to our ecosystem? Yeah, so love them or loathe them, um, humans can't survive without insects. Uh, they do a lot of ecosystem services, including pollination, like we've already spoken about. Flies in particular, which a lot of us don't like, um, are really important for cleaning up our environment. So if you think about what flies are doing a lot of the time, they're breaking down and eating gross stuff that we don't want around. Um, and there are countless different ways that insects are feeding animals that we do care about and like. Um, they, so larger predatory insects are really important for eating uh, mosquitoes. Imagine what that population would look like without dragonflies um, feeding them. And they are really important for feeding a lot of the, the other vilified beasts. So, uh, fish uh, that we like or dislike, and bats are really important. Well, well. You, you brought up dragonflies and you study them. Uh, what can you tell us about them? Well, they're my personal favorite. So dragonflies are lovely, often very hardy creatures. So that's, they are some of the, we think, winners in some of these um, urbanization and agriculture uh, pollution events. Um, and in one, one in particular, the one we're showing here, this is a really common not in, not currently endangered species of dragonfly called the green darner. And what's very, very cool about them that most people don't know is that like monarch butterflies that we know quite a bit about um, in, in the public sphere, the green darner dragonfly also has a multi-generational uh, migration every year where they go south to the southern United States or the Caribbean or Mexico um, every winter and then fly back north to Canada in the spring. And often you'll see them before the local population. So there are some that stick around all year in Canada. But in Ontario, we can sometimes see them flying north and showing up before our local animals have even arrived. So they're there creating uh, habitats and making sure our, uh, the early mosquitoes are being eaten um, right away. Um, I just realized that uh, the dragonflies are also one of my favorite bugs. And I wonder too, though, do you think that 
it matters what these creatures look like when we become squirmy, because I notice that all the things that make me squirm might not be as pretty as a dragonfly. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yes, definitely. <laughs> and if you're familiar with what dragonflies look like while they're juveniles, so as larvae, they live in aquatic environments, so streams and ponds, and they're really important, again, for eating mosquitoes while they're larvae. Um, they aren't quite as cute, and uh, they aren't showing up nearly as much in wallpaper and jewelry. Um, they look kind of, they're, they're wingless, they look a little bit like tiny aliens, um, and they're quite voracious as predators, so they do eat each other quite a bit. There's a bit of cannibalism, and they'll eat pretty much anything that they can fit in their mouths. Okay, my eyebrows just went up. <laughs> I have a few more bugs to get to before we wrap up. Um, another bug that we're hearing a lot about in Ontario is the gypsy moth caterpillar. Why is it a problem? Yeah, so the problem with it is that it's invasive. So it's from Eurasia. It was introduced in the 1800s. Um, and it's steadily expanded its range, and it loves to eat oak trees. So it defoliates them. It lives for a few weeks in the summer, but long enough to eat, um, eat an, like, well, there's enough of them that they can eat and defoliate and kill um, several trees um, in a forest. And why is that a problem for us? So defoliating the tree is obviously problematic for the the oaks, that's their favorite. They will eat hundreds of other species of trees. Um, but if it kills all of our trees and is killing our forests and out-competing our native uh, butterfly and moth populations and caterpillars for access to that food resource, it's obviously going to be a problem uh, for us in cons conserving these habitats in the future. Uh, do they have a predator? So they have the same predators that uh, all most uh, caterpillars and moths do. So um, mice, moles, uh, birds uh, will eat a lot of them. Um, bats, while they're uh, when they're adults as well, and they're just they're really well adapted to this environment, and they're spreading throughout um, Canada and the U.S. and in the Ottawa region right now. They're having a huge problem with them. People can, uh, there are a number of things that people can do. So one thing that's great is that when they do show up in these huge aggregations, um, like they're seeing in the Ottawa region right now, um, there is a natural virus that kills them. Um, and basically, you've probably seen them if you've paid attention, they basically get melted from the inside out and melt out of trees uh, and fall to the forest floor where they infect other Sorry, caterpillars. they melt inside out? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so this, uh, this Bacula virus uh, kills them by basically melting the entire animal. And then when it falls out of the tree as this gooey glump, uh, it, uh, it can infect the other animals that are underneath the tree. <laughs> that is wild. Um. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, if, if you pay attention to trees above you um, in forested areas, you might see it. Yeah. Um, is there yeah. anything else that people can do to protect their trees uh, from these caterpillars? Yeah, so one thing you can do, if, if you go online and you look up, the, they have these clumps of eggs that they lay on the bark. You can scrape those off in the fall and prevent next year's um, animals from eating your tree. Um, and to kill them, all you have to do is put them in some soapy water. Um, similarly, with the caterpillars, they don't like, especially as they get older, they don't like the, the dry heat. So people can put burlap around their tree um, so that caterpillars will hide in there. And if you check daily, you can put them again into soapy water to get rid of them so that they don't uh, emerge, mate, and reproduce in your tree again. Uh, we can't talk about summer and not talk about mosquitoes. Uh, they're everywhere. Um, and we also know that they do carry diseases. What should we be on the lookout for in Ontario? So uh, in Ontario and in Canada generally, we're quite lucky in that we don't have the majority of the disease-causing mosquito species, uh, largely because it's just too cold here. However, we do have a couple of diseases um, that people should be paying attention to, and certainly the governments, Ontario and the Canadian government, are paying attention to, and those are West Nile virus and Eastern equine encephalitis. Can you tell us more about that? Because I've, I've heard there's been a few cases of West Nile virus in Ontario. 
Yes. So uh, the first reported case in Ontario was in 2002, and they've been doing surveillance uh, monitoring for West Nile virus since then. And what they do is they both report, um, they have public health units that are reporting on the humans that are infected. They're also paying attention um, to horses who are often infected as well. And this is for West Nile virus I'm talking about. Um, and every year within... Um, Within Canada, we've had between tens to hundreds, depending on the year, um, of human cases of West Nile virus. And you also mentioned encephalitis. What is that? Yeah, so Eastern equine encephalitis. Luckily, we've never seen a human case in Canada, but we do uh, veterinary. Um, we do pay attention to veterinary records, and we have had horses in the past in Ontario that have had this disease from from mosquitoes. And um, what happens when they do get that disease? So uh, I'm not a medical doctor, but uh, in general, the horses get extremely sick um, in both cases. Uh, the thing about West Nile virus is that four out of five patients are estimated to not show any symptoms. So all of these numbers of the number of people infected are probably gross underestimations of how many people get West Nile virus every year in Ontario. Uh, well, public health does track West Nile cases as well as Lyme disease, uh, which is mm -hmm. caused by ticks. How are we doing this year with that? Um, so this year, uh, we're doing pretty well for West Nile virus. Um, Lyme disease is a lot harder um, because a lot of the symptoms look like other common illnesses. Um, in terms of ticks, we're not doing great um, in general. Uh, since the 60s and 70s, ticks, uh, and in particular deer ticks, like the one shown here, have been steadily increasing um, and moving further and further north. So a combination of climate change and um, increased populations of white-tailed deer, which are their preferred food source, have caused a huge increase in the number of ticks that are in Ontario. Um, what should people do, because people are going to the cottage, people are going camping, um, and you're bound to come up with something that you might not notice. When you do go out, what should you be on the lookout just in case you do get bitten by a tick? So a couple of things. Uh, first, uh, not all ticks will carry the bacteria that can cause Lyme disease. Um, so don't freak out. <laughs> <laughs> and the sh Doing tick checks at least daily when you're out in the woods and out in your garden where you know there are deer is a really good idea because the longer they are feeding on you, the more likely they are to pass on whatever bacteria they are carrying. Um, but a few things that people can do just when they go out in the woods is wearing um, long pants tucked into socks um, and long t-shirts, particularly if they're light in color because Sometimes ticks can be the size of a poppy seed, so they are quite small. So if you're wearing black or dark clothing, sometimes it's difficult to see. Um, and yes, doing tick checks, particularly for your children and dogs daily, is really important for checking in all the crevices. And also checking for dogs, right? Yes, yeah. So they, they like all kinds of different animals. <laughs> they feed on blood, so birds are a huge... Um, Birds, mice, deer, dogs, cats, um, all of these animals, including humans, are at risk. Um, however, keep in mind that ticks don't like dry, um, hot weather. They like it to be moist. So you're more at risk in the forest than you are on the soccer field, if that makes sense. It does make sense. Um, with all these things happening in the year of 2020, which seems like it's been a, a decade of its own, what do you think that we should keep in mind when we do talk about bugs and our relationship to them? Uh, keep in mind that most insects are not there to hurt you. They don't care about you for the most part. Um, and they are performing essential ecosystem services. So if you have a ton of flies on your property, that's probably a good thing. They're probably pollinating a whole bunch of flowers for you. Um, keeping your property a little bit messy here and there is hugely beneficial. So having some wildflowers, if you do plant a garden or you have um, a balcony where you can plant some flowers, try to make them native Ontario flowers because you're more likely to be helping out some of the native species rather than invasive species. It's summertime, but we also should be thinking about uh, what we do in the winter to allow bugs to survive in our environment. Uh, what do you suggest, Rosalind? So one thing that's becoming really apparent, particularly in places where 
um, we have strong winters, cold places, uh, is that the increased use of road salt because of urbanization, because we're increasing the number of roads, um, has caused a lot of problems for aquatic insects. And um, unfortunately, one insect that's totally fine, it seems, with high salt environments is mosquitoes. So when we're using salt, certainly we have to use some salt because they make our roads much safer. But just on your own property, when you're starting to um, think about what you're using, just be conscious of how much you're using because it will help um, keep some of the mosquito predators alive in nearby ponds and streams. Um, as dangerous uh, or invasive as some bug species can be, they're also a source of food or a delicacy. I've tried weevils and I've also had uh, grasshoppers. Mm -hmm. Have you ever tried eating them? Uh, yeah, I've had some, uh, we had a lab meeting one year and someone brought uh, brownies made from cricket flour. So I've had brownies that Was tasted it, like brownies. Were they delicious <laughs> or did they taste like chicken? <laughs> They, they tasted like brownies, you couldn't tell. <laughs> Rosalind, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. We've learned a lot about bugs and also our relationship to them. We appreciate your time and insight. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.